Hey guys, Miss Hill here, and we are going to be talking about um, prematurity today. So we're still in individual module six, and this is PowerPoint two, lecture one. So here are your learning outcomes, and they are again the same as what is in your book. I've included a March of Dimes link. Um, it's a little video that talks about the economic and societal costs of babies being born premature. And uh, it's worth a watch if you have a chance. So when we talk about premature infants, we are talking about babies that are at least 20 weeks or greater in gestation, but they are born before 37 weeks of gestation. So the premature infant is one that is born after 20 weeks or before 37 weeks. Um, about 10% of all births in the United States happen to be premature births. And uh, the, the good thing, though, is that with uh, modern technology, um, neonates are surviving at younger gestational ages. Um, however, that comes with a cost. Um, the costs for premature um, deliveries and premature infants can be very significant, especially if they are left with um, lifelong de delays and problems associated with prematurity. Um, there's also been a rise in um, multiples in terms of um, twins and triplets and that type of thing. So along with technology, not only are we able to keep these children um, alive whenever they are born early, but along with technology, we have also been able to develop ways to help people get pregnant who have issues with infertility. And oftentimes those um, procedures will result in multiple pregnancies. So. Um, so, such as twins, triplets, etc. And because of that, um, we know that ladies who are pregnant with multiples tend to deliver much early. So our advance in technology has um, helped this problem, but in some ways has sort of increased the rate um, of premature births as well. The major problem with premature babies is that they are severely immature in regards to their body systems. And the degree of immaturity of those systems depend on how old they are in terms of gestational weeks. So the younger the gestation, the more problems we see. Preterm newborns. Um, have to go through the same type of adaptations to extra uterine life as a term newborn does. But the problem with that is that they are less equipped to be able to do that adaptation to extra uterine life smoothly because of their system immaturity. There are lots of risk factors associated with prematurity, and um, this is definitely not an all-inclusive list, but um, teenagers and adolescents, um, people who are single, tend to be at a greater risk for prematurity, and it can be for a number of different reasons. Number um, Adolescents specifically are immature from a system standpoint themselves. Um, people who are single, may be of a lower socioeconomic status than those individuals who are married or who have a significant other and a support system. Substance abusers, uh, ladies that have multiple pregnancies, ones that lack prenatal care, all of those individuals are at risk for having an, uh, a baby that is premature. Um, 
when we start talking about things like gestational hypertension, preeclampsia, um, and eclampsia, those individuals are also at risk to have premature babies because we know that the cure for those illnesses is delivery of the baby. People who have a history of delivering infants preterm are at a greater um, risk to do that with subsequent pregnancies as well. And we discussed cervical incompetence a little in class. Um, and so what we know about cervical incompetence is that there's no warning sign for that. So we don't know to begin with who is at risk for cervical incompetence or who it will happen to. And usually when it happens the first time, the result of that is a pre-viable or a premature infant um, just right out the gate and we don't have a way to stop it or manage it or predict it. But after the first delivery that's related to cervical incompetence, then we know that person um, has this risk factor and it will happen to them again in subsequent pregnancies so we can intervene early on in their pregnancy and do a cerclage to stitch the cervix up to prevent this cervical dilation that happens at such an early stage. Um, so after the first incidence of cervical incompetence, we can um, pretty much prevent the prematurity that occurs for subsequent times. Ladies who have premature rupture of membranes also are at risk for babies with prematurity. Typically, when your membranes rupture, that's a uh, sign that labor is going to happen and the delivery will occur. Um, there are cases where people have a premature rupture of membranes and we are able to stop the labor process with medications and medical interventions. Um, but we would not send those individuals home, um, particularly if they are uh, premature. Um, we would keep those individuals in the hospital if they're very early on in gestation and monitor them very closely for infection, but we would do what we could to um, prevent delivery unless we are seeing signs of infection. Um, so sometimes they might spend up weeks in the hospital to allow the babies to develop um, even more. For chronic mental, um, for chronic maternal illnesses such as diabetes and hypertension, kidney problems, um, these individuals are also at risk to have babies that are um, premature. Um, for diabetes, we know that those babies get very big very quickly and so there may be times where um, it's more appropriate to deliver a premature baby um, than to risk the continued growth of one um, due to diabetes. Trauma, so individuals uh, who are experiencing violence, intimate partner abuse, um, those individuals who've gotten in motor vehicle accidents and might be experiencing an abruption related to that or some um, type of uh, trauma associated with a motor vehicle accident or types of violence might require us to deliver the baby early. Um, particularly if you have a mom who may not live. Um, if we have, um, if we believe that we could deliver a premature baby, even if the mom would is not going to live, um, typically we will do that to save the newborn. And then those individuals who have uterine abnormalities that um, put them at a greater risk for premature labor, they are uh, subsequently at a greater risk for premature delivery.
So let's take a, a look at the respiratory and the cardiac physiology related to um, preterm kids. So preterm newborns are at risk for respiratory problems, and that is the first thing typically that people think about whenever they think about premature babies, that they can't breathe on their own. And, um, and for some premature babies, that is very true, but not for all of them. Um, but in general, the premature baby's lungs are not fully mature. They're not ready to take over that process of exchanging oxygen and carbon dioxide without having some type of assistance to do that. So um, some critical factors to consider when we're talking about respiratory and cardiac issues are that the preterm infant is um, unable to produce adequate amounts of surfactant. And what we know about surfactant is surfactant is a lipid um, that helps to keep alveoli open. If we didn't have surfactant, our alveoli would collapse. Um, and we know that alveoli have to be open to be able to exchange that oxygen and carbon dioxide. Um, so surfactant we know um, is closely related to the LS ratio in amniotic fluid and we know that we want a two at least a two to one ratio um, of the of that um, to give us a good indication that the baby will probably do okay when it's born. So we know that sphingolomyelin remains consistent in amniotic fluid throughout a pregnancy, but lithiasin um, actually increases. So the further along the pregnancy gets, the more lithiasin we have compared to sphingolomyelin, which is why we want that two to one ratio. And, um, and that is very closely linked, linked to surfactant. So um, having enough surfactant to sustain your open alveoli um, is key in being able to have a newborn that can move through a respiratory adaptation to extra uterine life appropriately. These guys also have a really incompletely developed muscular system. So um, their pulmonary blood vessels, I mean your, your blood vessels are smooth muscles and um, not only are they underdeveloped in terms of um, their musculoskeletal system, but even in terms of the musculature coating on their pulmonary blood vessels. So if those blood vessels cannot dilate and contract appropriately to be able to shunt blood to the appropriate places in the lungs, they have a more difficult time exchanging oxygen and carbon dioxide. Also, their ductus arteriosus may remain open instead of closing as we would expect for a term newborn. So if the ductus arteriosus remains open, then this baby is going to um, shunt their blood um, from the pulmonary artery into the proximal descending aorta. So what happens is that allows most of the blood from the right ventricle to bypass the fetus's lungs, which we want whenever they're a fetus. But whenever they're born premature and this ductus arteriosus remains open, um, we want that shunting to stop because we want the blood to head to the lungs to be able to exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide. And if it remains open, it's being shunted into um, the rest of the vasculature for the body through the aorta. So we, we end up with large portions of blood that are not being um, oxygenated. Heat loss is probably one of, this is probably the second major problem when it comes to 
um, premature infants. We think about lung issues initially, and um, then you think about thermoregulation. Because heat production is very limited um, in premature babies, they um, don't have a ton of glycogen um, available in the liver, and they typically don't have a lot of brown fat available to be able to metabolize in order to keep their um, body temperature up. Both of these things, the glycogen in the liver and the brown fat that's available for energy, appear typically in the third trimester. So if the baby doesn't make it to the third trimester, it's lacking those key components to be able to thermoregulate extra uterine, um, in extra uterine life. Um, also, the hypoxic newborn cannot increase their oxygen consumption in response to cold stress because their reserves are already very limited. So if you have a newborn who is already hypoxic due to lung problems, they are not able to increase their oxygen demands in order to thermoregulate. So now we have one problem that is compounding another. Um, preterm neonates have a much smaller muscle mass, so they don't have um, the ability to utilize their muscles in order to produce heat. So they are unable to shiver. Um, you learned in the last lecture that if a newborn begins to shiver, a term newborn, if they start to shiver, they have, in, they have already doubled their basal metabolic rate. And um, premature babies have an inability to do this. And that um, compounds the heat loss problem. There are five factors that increase heat loss in the preterm neonate, and they have a higher ratio of body surface area to body weight. They have very little subcutaneous fat, a thinner and more permeable skin, and they also have a more um, hypotonic posture so that influences heat loss. Um, this slide from your book says that it's a more flexed posture, but newborns are not more flexed. Newborns are less flexed than a normal newborn. And because of that, they expose a larger portion of their body surface area um, to the external environment, and that encourages more heat loss. Um, they have a decreased ability to vasoconstrict their superficial blood vessels and conserve heat in the core of their body. Um, and remember, you know, all of these things kind of relate back to each other. Um, we said they were immature from a musculoskeletal standpoint, not only um, for, the, for the musculoskeletal system, but just in terms of the musculature that surrounds their blood vessels. And so that... Um, takes a takes a toll when it comes to vasoconstriction and trying to conserve heat. Um, think about going outside for just for yourself in the dead of winter um, with no gloves on. If it's super cold outside, your hands get very cold. Um, your face will get very cold if it's um, left open. We, your head gets cold, especially if you have short hair. Um, but if you stay out too long, um, your hands are not getting cold just because of the air outside, but your body constricts its blood vessels to try to shunt blood to the core and keep yourself, keep your um, body temperature at a normal level. Our bodies are amazing things and they um, have so many different mechanisms to try to keep your 
um, system in homeostasis and premature newborns are lacking many of those compensatory mechanisms um, to be able to keep them at a homeostatic um, place. Their gestational age is directly proportional to their ability to maintain thermoregulation. So the more preterm the baby is, the less able it is to maintain its heat balance. And nurses can help provide a neutral thermal environment, but one of the, um, and this is one of the most important things that you can do for a premature newborn is provide heat. Um, so remember though that the neutral thermal environment does not mean the temperature of the room. It means a level um, that the newborn can, um, a, a, an environment that the newborn can be placed in to keep that individual's um, oxygen consumption and basal metabolic rate at a minimal level enable to keep their temperature um, up appropriately. So it can be individualized from person to person. I believe that we already said these guys have a very little subcutaneous fat and uh, so you can think about that as insulation. Um, they, they don't have any insulation to keep their little home warm. Um, they uh, we did talk about the hypotonic um, posture. And think back to your Ballard assessment whenever we're talking about these differences in the preterm compared to the term newborn. And think about all those little pictures on your Ballard assessment and what the preterm photographs look like compared to, or the little stick babies. Um, what those compare, what those look like compared to the term newborn and the things that I'm talking about to you through this PowerPoint and the things that are listed here, you will see show up on that Ballard assessment. So be able to connect those pieces. Um, before we move on, I do want to mention something else about the respiratory system. Um, newborns will have something that we call apnea of prematurity and uh, we expect that in um, premature newborns we watch for it and we support respirations but that just means that they have apnea that is greater than 20 seconds and um, or it can also be less than 20 seconds if it's associated with cyanosis, pallor, or bradycardia. Um, so you might take care of newborns that are diagnosed with something called apnea of prematurity, and that's what it means. So from a gastrointestinal standpoint, um, newborns have uh, a basic um, GI tract because it's formed really early on in gestation. Um, but the maturation of their digestive system and the way they absorb nutrients are much more variable in terms of gestation. Um, some of the GI problems that we see in premature newborns um, are aspiration risks. Um, they have a really difficult time meeting their caloric needs um, due to their immature body systems and how hard their bodies are having to work to adapt to extra uterine life. So typically we have to provide them with a higher calorie formula or we have to supplement breast milk with calories. Um, they need fluid to be able to grow. Um, and one of the biggest things is being able to feed these guys so that we can promote um, some growth and development from an extra uterine standpoint. They have a really limited ability to convert certain types of amino acids to um, non-essential ones. Um, and they have um, an inability to handle increased osmolar protein. So we um, may not be able to just give formula 
that we would term newborn because their um, guts are so sensitive. They have a difficulty absorbing saturated fats. Um, initially, they have difficulty with lactose digestion as well. Um, and possibly have a deficiency of calcium and phosphorus. They have a much more increased basal metabolic rate and increased oxygen requirements. And because of that, they um, have a hard time tolerating feedings. Um, if they, um, feeding is probably the um, hardest work that um, babies have to do. And for premature babies, um, it becomes sometimes almost an impossible task because they are working so hard just to keep their temperature up and to keep their respiratory system um, exchanging oxygen and carbon dioxide and, and keeping themselves from becoming hypoxic that they don't have the extra energy to spend um, to suck in terms of feeding or even to di use energy to digest um, food that they take in. Um, also, um, if we go back to the aspiration risk, we've talked about how their musculature is very immature. So um, they will not um, move fluid and, and food through their gut as um, effectively as a term newborn would. Um, and if our musculature is immature and our sphincters are not working um, like they should, then we become at risk to aspirate what we take in. Um, newborns also, uh, premature newborns also have a really decreased gag reflex. They have a decreased stomach size and that also puts them at risk for aspiration. Um, many times they're at risk for delayed growth even when we feed them because they um, don't have the ability to take in um, the food they need to grow at a rate we want them to. Um, and they get very fatigued whenever um, you, you try to feed them. And uh, necrotizing enterocolitis also can occur with these guys because uh, from a GI standpoint, they are um, so sensitive. From a kidney standpoint, um, we know that premature newborns are at risk for dehydration and overhydration because their kidneys have an inability to concentrate urine well. Um, sorry, my phone's blowing up. Um, their kidneys are immature compared to the term neonate, and uh, we, we know that newborns are uh, less likely to concentrate urine well as two. Uh, I've lost my train of thought, you guys. There's stuff going on outside my office door and it's distracting me. All right, I'm going to start over. So the kidneys are immature compared to the term neonate. And what we know about the term neonate is that they have difficulty concentrating urine as well. So from a premature standpoint, now we're at an even greater risk for dehydration because they are even less able to concentrate urine. So um, from a nursing standpoint, it can become a problem in terms of trying to manage fluids and electrolyte imbalances um, because we can overload them very, very quickly and we um, can dehydrate them very, very quickly. So it's a, a um, a very delicate balancing act. Some specific renal characteristics that we think of with the preterm neonate are that their glomerular filtration rate is much lower, so they have an inability to get rid of fluid as quickly. Their kidneys are limited in the ability to concentrate so uh, they excrete excess amounts of fluid 
uh, putting them at risk for dehydration. Their kidneys begin excreting glucose at lower serum glucose levels, so they become hypoglycemic quicker. Um, they have a really a reduced buffering capacity, um, and their immaturity of the renal system also affects their ability to be able to excrete drugs. So not only um, from a administration standpoint um, in terms of nursing care, but um, also if you have a premature baby who's been born to a mother um, who is using illicit drugs, they have an inability to be able to excrete those things um, as well as a term baby would. Um, and then, you know, if you're giving these type kids antibiotics or other types of medications, you want to be monitoring um, the renal system and the potential side effects of those medications because their body doesn't filter them um, and, and excrete them and metabolize them as well as your term neonate would. With a um, premature newborn, their immunologic um, capacity is very depressed compared to a term newborn. They are at a much greater risk for infection. Um, sepsis can happen much more quickly and much more easily with a preterm compared to a um, term newborn. Maternal IgA immunoglobulins cross the placenta in the very last trimester. So preterm neonates have very, very few of these IgA um, antibodies at birth. And existing antibodies provide much less protection and they are depleted much earlier than in a term neonate. So, the, so what they do have does not last as long. They have a really higher incidence of recurrent infection in their first year of life, so they tend to be sickly kids. Um, and then secretory IgA that you find in breast milk provides a really good immunity from enteric infections like necrotizing enterocolitis. So we use breast milk sometimes as a medication for preterm newborns in order to provide their gut with some normal flora to prevent bad things from growing um, in their GI tract. Their skin is also really easily excoriated. We have to be very careful about tape and um, touching and bumping these kids on side rails or, you know, on their little um, bassinets or whatever it is that they are, um, whatever they're in in the hospital because their thin is so much thinner than your term newborn. Um, there's also, uh, we know that our skin is the largest organ in the body and it is the one thing that protects us against infections probably more than anything else. So if it's thin and it's easily damaged in the preterm newborn, these guys are at a much higher risk for healthcare associated infections because of poor hand hygiene. So anyone who comes to visit these guys or takes care of these um, little babies need some serious hand hygiene education and um, monitoring. We need to be scrubbing from the elbows down in between fingers under the fingernails for five minutes before you ever touch these guys and in between patients. From a neurologic standpoint, we know that the general shape of their brain um, is a, a fetal brain is formed in the first six weeks of gestation, but the total um, there's the total complement of neurons proliferates between the second and the fourth months of gestation.
myelination starts during the second trimester and then continues into adult life. And the most rapid brain growth in the fetus occurs in the third trimester. And there's also a lot of brain growth that happens in the late preterm period. So when, so when you think from like 34 to 37-ish, 37 to 39-ish, um, a lot of rapid brain, brain growth happens during that time. So the closer that we can get a fetus to term gestationally is much better um, on their neurologic prognosis. There's a common interruption of neurologic development in the preterm baby and a lot of the times that is caused by intraventricular hemorrhage and intracranial hemorrhage. Um, and one reason why that happens is because the lining of the ventricles in a preterm are very vascular and they are very responsive to hypoxic events. So those little vasculature areas will rupture easily in um, the event of hypoxic injury. And we know that newborns don't breathe very well. Um, so that's one reason why they're at a great risk for that. And, uh, you know, for lack of a better way to say it, these guys can stroke out. Um, hydrocephalus also may develop as a consequence if intraventricular hemorrhage um, is caused by an obstruction at the cerebral aqueduct, and that can have problems all of its own. Um, these guys are um, also at risk for anemia because they have such a rapid growth rate requirement and their red blood cell lifespan is much more decreased. And we're constantly taking blood samples from them as well. So what about reactivity and behavioral states in the preterm? So periods of reactivity are much more delayed um, there, you may not be able to observe them even at all in a very ill um, neonate, one that's very sickly. Typically, they're hypotonic. Um, they will be um, unreactive, sometimes for several days after birth, depending on how early they are gestationally. Um, a baby's unique behavioral states and traits can be identified with growth and stability of the baby's condition. So as long as we can get these kids growing, keep their condition stable, then you'll be able to start to recognize some uniqueness in terms of their behavior and um, the different traits that they will begin to exhibit. Stable preterm neonates don't really uh, demonstrate some of the same behavioral states as term neonates. Um, they are much more disorganized in their sleep and their wake patterns. Um, they are unable to focus in on the human face or on objects that are surrounding them in the environment. Um, so it's, it can be a little more difficult for them to bond with their parents because they um, don't tend to focus um, on things as well as the term baby does. And um, by observing patterns of behavior and responses, especially when we're thinking about sleep and wake cycles, um, the parents and the nurse can figure out when to plan care and be able to best attend to the newborn's needs. So if we can figure out um, what times they are more alert 
then we can have the parents visit at that time so we can promote bonding or we can provide certain types of care during that time um, to help connective brain, you know, to can help neurons connect. Um, parents can also um, learn the meaning of their newborn's responses and behaviors and the nurse is in a key position to help that happen. We want to begin feedings as soon as we possibly can and um, that's really valuable in maintaining a normal metabolism for these guys and decreasing the possibility of complications. You know, one of the number one things that we want to accomplish in preterm babies is growth and um, weight gain. And so if we have one that we're unable to feed, um, that can sometimes hinder what our, our outcomes need to be. The preterm neonate at risk um, for complications of immaturity of the digestive system happens. Um, and we can try to manage this through advancing feedings only as um, you can assess that they are tolerating what you're giving them. So we have to be very cognizant about how well what we are feeding they are tolerating and um, then we can start to advance from there. Um, clinical signs that you will see of feeding intolerance or illness um, could be um, things like they sweat when they eat, um, they are um, spitting up, they are having vomiting, maybe they are having diarrhea if their gut isn't um, handling what they're being given. Um, they may, if they're doing things other than enteral feedings such as bottle feeding you might see them sweat um, or start to turn blue around the mouth any of those things will tell you that they are becoming hypoxic and that they're stressed out in terms of feeding and so if those any of those types of signs are observed we would discontinue or hold our advancement of those feedings. Most of the time preterm babies are um, fed in an enteral manner, so through an OG tube usually. Um, their caloric intake needs to be at least 95 to 130 kilocalories a day. They require much more protein than a term neonate, and um, that's because we need to build them up. We want them to grow, and um, many places will use breast milk or special preterm formulas so that we can meet the requirement of those, and breast milk sometimes might have to be enhanced with extra calories or extra um, types of minerals or protein or whatever. Um, feeding regimens and plans are based on the preterm's weight and their estimated stomach capacity. So if we're doing enteral feedings for a newborn, um, for a preterm baby, we would be calculating how much they need based on how much they weigh and based on um, what we believe their stomach capacity can hold. We would give um, supplemental multivitamins to these guys because they are depleted of those and, and just have not had a chance to develop um, what they need. And um, usually intake is adequate if weight gain is around 20 to 30 grams a day, that's what we'd like to see. So a couple of um, 
or a few different ways that we can feed the preterm. We can utilize bottle feeding um, if the baby has a coordinated and arrhythmic suck and swallow and breathing pattern. So babies have to be able to do all three of those things at one time, even the term newborn, in order to be able to feed appropriately. They have to be able to suck, swallow, and breathe. And they have to be able to do it in a pattern that allows them to maintain their um, oxygenation. So usually between 32 and 34 weeks, they're able to do this. But before that, they really have a lot of problems. And remember, they also have that decreased gag reflex. So if we're bottle feeding these guys, we would want to be extremely careful in terms of um, aspiration. Cues that babies are ready to feed by mouth would be things like they start bringing their hands to their mouth. They're more alert and they're having periods where they are being alert for longer stages. Um, they're starting to get fussy. Um, they will suck on their fingers or on a pacifier. They'll exhibit a rooting reflex. Um, they may have a facial or relaxed facial expression and now they've got some better tone um, comparatively to what they were. We can also um, encourage breastfeeding and if they have the, um, if their moms choose to do this, we want to give her the opportunity um, as soon as the baby has demonstrated the ability to be coordinated with the suck and swallow reflex is showing really consistent weight gain and can control their body temperature outside of the incubator. And that really doesn't depend on weight. Um, if the mom is going to breastfeed their baby, um, we would do it skin to skin um, so that they have that temperature um, stability for mom. Preterm neonates um, can tolerate breastfeeding with higher transcutaneous oxygen pressures and better maintenance of body temperature than during bottle feeding. So they're able to more easily breastfeed is basically what this says than, uh, than they are to bottle feed. And then we know that that breastfeeding carries many benefits nutritionally and immunologically. Um, there are some really great benefits of breast milk um, that the preterm baby can um, really benefit from. And it also allows the mom to be able to actively contribute to caring for the newborn and um, sort of doing her part. So being able to breastfeed a preterm baby who is having to spend weeks in the NICU, sometimes moms begin to feel very useless, like they can't take care of their babies. And uh, it can be psychologically very depressing for them. So allowing them to actively contribute to their baby's well-being um, can also help them adapt to this mother role as well and it will increase bonding. If the neonate cannot be put to the breast, moms can pump and then it can be given by a bottle or through gavage feedings and many NICUs, um, probably all of them nowadays, have um, a room and pumps available for moms to be able to do this, special refrigerators that their breast milk can be stored in, um, even if they can't put the baby to the breast. So still talking about breastfeeding, skin-to-skin -skin contact and holding can significantly increase the mom's milk volume and that will help in preventing or overcoming any lactation problems that could have happened. Um, and the length of the feeding time is monitored pretty closely so that the preterm neonate does not burn too many calories because again, even though we're breastfeeding and that's an easier way um, sometimes for the preterm baby to feed, 
it um, still is very hard work and can cause them to burn too many calories. And the goal is for them to grow and not lose weight. So we try to prevent them from burning calories if um, we have control over that. Nurses should be able to coordinate with the parents to get a really flexible feeding schedule um, because we want the babies to be able to nurse during really alert times and to be able to set their own pace. Um, we want feedings to happen on demand, meaning on demand from the baby. Um, but we do have to keep in mind that we don't want them to burn too many calories. So we may have to set a limit in terms of how many hours um, of rest should happen between feedings. Another way that we feed preterm newborns is through something called gavage. And for preterm neonates who do not have the ability to suck and swallow and breathe, so they don't have this reflex, or they're very ill and they're ventilator dependent, we might have to use gavage feeding. Um, we can use gavage feeding as an adjunct to breastfeeding or to bottle feeding if the baby tires out very um, quickly. And we can also use it as an alternative if we're unable to feed by nipple or if the baby is losing weight. So if the baby's losing weight and they're nipple feeding, that tells you they're burning too many calories. Um, we can use it in an intermittent manner or in a continuous drip. And we administer it through a nasogastric or an orogastric route and um, can be with an intermittent bolus or the continuous drip again. Um, usually the bolus is preferred because uh, the thought is that it's more like a normal feeding to provide a bolus. Um, and that can help um, their bodies adjust. Early initiation of minimal enteral nutrition via gavage is advocated um, as a supplement to parenteral nutrition. So we want to be um, we want to be using enteral nutrition if we can um, instead of like TPN. So TPN is used in situations that will not, um, a preterm newborn will not be allowed to feed through the GI tract. Um, so I would think that this would occur in situations where the GI tract isn't developed enough um, to be able to, or, or is not tolerating um, feedings. Maybe a baby's got some necrotizing enterocolitis and then we're going to have to do TPN. Um, IV provision of complete nutrition is basically what this is and we use some type of hyperalimentation that provides calories and vitamins and minerals and proteins and glucose and then it also uses lipids to provide the fatty acids. All of you should be aware of what TPN is. Um, fluid requirements for a preterm is based on their weight and their postnatal age. And the average recommendations are somewhere from 80 to 100 milliliters per kilogram per day for the first day of life. Um, anywhere from 100 to 120 for the second day and 120 to 150 for the third day. And then we can increase it up to 200 uh, milliliters per kilogram per day if the baby is very small, if the baby is receiving some type of phototherapy or under the radiant warmer, um, because all of those things tell you that they need more calories. Follow-up care of the preterm 
um, baby is extremely important because they have many developmental problems um, that might not be um, assessed until they start to grow and get older. They might begin to demonstrate different types of motor delays or sensory disabilities. So um, frequent follow-up care is really important for these guys. Low birth weight preterm babies face much more um, higher mortality rates in the first year of life. We see more of these guys die from sudden infant death syndrome, from respiratory infections, and from different neurological defects. And most commonly what we see in terms of long-term needs are um, eye issues because of retinopathy that happens due to prematurity. Um, high concentrations of oxygen can uh, contribute to retinopathy. So we um, try to be very careful about high level, giving high levels of oxygen to premature babies and newborns, um, but sometimes we just have to. And um, they also may have bronchopulmonary dysplasia, speech defects, neurologic defects. Some of them will have auditory defects. Um, and the list goes on and on. Parents have to understand that developmental progress has to be evaluated on the basis of chronologic age from the expected date of birth, not their actual date of birth. And parents need a consistent support of healthcare professionals, and but not just healthcare professionals. We need consistent support for these parents in terms of community resources, support groups, um, other parents who are in the same situations. Um, many hospitals and NICUs will provide referrals to local child health services coordination programs early intervention service programs to try to pull together as much collaboration for these parents and uh, their kid as um, we can. And nurses should be aware of the agency's referral process and know about how local and available services work um, to be able to point parents in the right direction and provide them um, with the necessary information. There are some alterations of prematurity and uh, I already told you about apnea of prematurity. Remember this is where um, they have periods of apnea that, apnea that are greater than 20 seconds or periods of apnea that are less than 20 seconds if uh, they are accompanied by cyanosis. Um, by pallor or by bradycardia. Again, they can end up with a patent ductus arteriosus so that the blood is being shunted out to the fetal system instead of um, going to the lungs where we want it to go. Um, these guys can experience respiratory distress syndrome for reasons I, I have talked about repeatedly, intraventricular hemorrhages, anemia, um, and all of these things I, I have touched on um, in previous slides. From a nursing process standpoint, very, very subtle signs and symptoms can indicate a change in a premature baby's condition. And it can, um, and it needs to require super quick thinking and intervene to be able to mitigate problems that will happen. Um, Postgraduate specialized education is required for nurses who want to care for premature infants. So there's a lot of extra education that goes along with caring for these kids. It's so different. From an assessment standpoint, I want you to uh, really drill down on your Ballard assessment and be able to recognize the differences from a physical 
and a neurological perspective um, when comparing your premature to your term and post-term baby. So for premature baby, you're going to see physical characteristics that will vary greatly based upon their gestational age. If you have a baby that is born at 20 weeks, they are going to look much, much different than a baby who's born at 34 weeks. So you have to remember there's a wide range of physical assessment possibilities with these guys. Um, in general, their color, your color is going to be pink or ruddy, but you might see um, also acrocyanosis. Their skin tends to be more reddened and translucent, and they have very little subcutaneous fat. Um, lanugo, which is that little hair that they have all over their body, they have much of that. It's plentiful and it's widely distributed. Whereas in a term baby, you might find just very small patches of it here or there. Their head size is much larger in relation to their body and their skull bones are much more pliable. They're smooth and they have flat font nails. Their ears have very minimal cartilage and they are pliable. So when you fold them over, they will not recall back. They'll stay folded down. Um, their nails are very soft and very short. For boys, their testes may not be descended and their scrotum will be nice and smooth with no rugae. Um, for little girls, their clitoris and their labia minora are going to be the most prominent aspects of their genitalia. Um, their labia majora will not cover any of that. Um, in a resting position, they're going to be really flaccid and frog-like, so they're going to be hypotonic. Their cry is not lusty like you would expect for a normal newborn, but instead it's very weak and very feeble. Um, they may be missing some of their reflexes or have very poor reflexes, such as sucking, swallowing, and gagging, which can affect feeding um, and aspiration risks. And their movements are going to be jerky and very generalized. Some nursing diagnoses that you can consider in relationship to the preterm newborn are going to be impaired gas exchange, ineffective breathing pattern, um, tissue perfusion risks, um, imbalanced nutrition risks, uh, ineffective thermoregulation, fluid volume issues, and then from a family standpoint, coping mechanisms. Um, that may or may not be adequate or uh, be, you know, readiness for enhanced um, things. So when we plan care for these guys, um, goals are going to include first and foremost that they can oxygenate and uh, have some normal breathing patterns. So they might not be able to do that on their own, but we want to be able to support their efforts um, with as minimal intervention as possible for them to um, maintain appropriate oxygenation. We want weight gain and growth to be normal and we want to be able to promote that. Any developmental needs that they need from a neurological standpoint or from a musculoskeletal standpoint, we want to be able to support that as well. And we want to educate parents to provide the appropriate care. And we don't want to just educate them to provide this care, but we want them to be comfortable and feel supported with things that they may have to do at home. Um, because it is um, very stressful to take, to have especially no medical training and take home a kid that might be on a feeding tube or on a ventilator or need supportive respiratory measures. Um, so making sure that we give them plenty of education and um, allow them to voice concerns and their anxieties so that they feel supported.
So let's move on to implementation and things that we will do. Um, when it comes to maintaining the respiratory function for the preterm baby, we know that they are at an increased risk for respiratory problems. Um, and those respiratory problems can be caused by a number of different issues. Um, they are at, in, at an increased risk for obstruction related to mucus. So making sure that we are suctioning um, appropriately and only as needed um, is paramount. Um, positioning can also affect their respiratory function, so we want to keep their heads elevated slightly so we can maintain an airway, but we want to avoid hyperextension of their neck. We might have to place little small rolls under their shoulders so we can maintain their head in that kind of sniffing position. We'll monitor their heart rate, their respiratory rates, and we'll do that with cardiorespiratory monitors and, um, and continuous monitoring. And in case of respiratory distress, we want to give oxygen per our orders. Remember what I said about being too liberal with oxygen administration in newborns. It can cause retinopathy. So if we can avoid that, we want to. Um, hypoxemia is not treated immediately. Um, that is not treated immediately may result in um, a patent ductus arteriosus or metabolic acidosis. And if the oxygen is administered, the nurse needs to monitor that concentration with pulse ox and blood gases. We want to maintain um, a respiratory function also by monitoring for signs of distress. So if you begin to see cyanosis or tachypnea, retractions, grunting, flaring, if they're starting to have apneic episodes that are increasing in time or greater than 20 seconds, um, you're starting to heal, hear rails and ronchi in the lungs or diminished airway sounds. All of those things could be signs that your baby is experiencing some respiratory distress. Nurses need to consider their respiratory function of, the, of their patient before um, and after feedings. So we want to be monitoring them very closely before we feed them. And afterwards, we want to make sure that their gag and their suck reflexes are intact before we start to feed. And that is so we can prevent aspiration. Um, and we don't want to do anything that might increase their energy expenditure and their oxygen consumption if it's going, if they are already experiencing some respiratory distress. Maintaining a thermal neutral environment is also key. We want to minimize their oxygen consumption that is um, required in order to maintain their normal core temperature. That helps to prevent cold stress. And um, we've said over and over that cold stress will kill your baby. So preventing that um, <clears throat> is paramount. Facilities. Um, at, Maintaining the thermal neutral environment will facilitate growth um, because it will decrease the need for calories to maintain body temperature. And we want them to hold on to all the calories they can because we want them to grow. Um, so to minimize heat loss and temperature instability for the preterm baby, and low birth weight neonates, we can monitor ambient temperature of the room where the newborn is housed. We can allow skin-to-skin -skin contact between the parents and the baby. We can warm and humidify oxygen that is being given. So instead of just pumping out cold oxygen, we can actually warm that up for them. Um, we can place them in a double-walled incubator or use plexiglass heat shields um, in order to keep heat in 
and some institutions will use radiant warmers or plastic wrap over the baby which helps them to keep that body temperature up. We also want to avoid placing the baby on cold services. So if you're getting ready to weigh your baby, we don't want to put them on a cold scale um, so that they lose heat that way. We want to use warmed and ambient humidity um, that can help keep their environment stable. We want to make sure they stay dry and that they have a cap over their head because we know that's where they lose heat the most. And we also know that's the largest part and the largest surface area uh, on their body. We want to keep the warmers and the incubators and the cribs away from windows or um, like external or outside walls and away from doors that are opening up and uh, constantly. Um, when we open incubator portholes and doors, we only want to do that whenever it's necessary and then using the plastic sleeves that are on those portholes to provide care as much as possible. Um, we use skin probes to monitor their temperature consistently um, and continually. And if they're feeding, we want to be warming that up so that we're not introducing anything that's cooler than their temperature um, to them internally. We can use reflector patches on the skin um, when for, to monitor temperature whenever they're using the radiant warmer bed as well. Once the preterm newborn is medically stable, we can start to clothe it and put on a double thickness cap and a cotton shirt, put diapers on and swaddle them in a blanket if possible, but we wouldn't do this before they were stable. Um, nurses will begin weaning preterm babies to the crib when they are medically stable, they don't require any type of assisted ventilation and whenever their weight is somewhere between 1500 and 2000 grams. Um, they've got to have also five days of consecutive weight gain. They got to be taking oral feedings and any type of apneic or bradycardic episodes will have to be stabilized before we can move them out into a crib. In terms of maintaining the fluid and electrolyte status, um, we want to make sure we are uh, checking weight and monitoring that very frequently, um, knowing what the chronologic age is and making sure that volumes are sensible, um, that we know what volumes of sensible and insensible water losses are occurring because we want to be able, remember, to balance out overhydration with dehydration. We can evaluate hydration status by looking at fontanelles. If they're sunken in, <gasps> sorry y'all, talking a lot. Oh. Sorry, I needed a moment to stretch and yawn. All right, so uh, we can evaluate hydration status by asse assessing uh, fontanelles, whether they're sunken in. Um, that will tell us that they're dehydrated. If they're starting to lose weight, if they have poor skin turker or dry oral mucous membranes, their urine output is beginning to decrease and specific gravity is increasing. Those are all telling us that um, they've got some dehydration going on. And we also have to be looking for that overhydration. So if they have edema or they're uh, gaining excessive weight or you're starting to hear things in the lungs, um, all of those things might identify some overhydration is starting to occur. We want to make sure we're weighing the preterm newborn at least once a day and we want to be doing it at the same time. 
Weight change is probably the most sensitive indicator of fluid balance, so it's important that we monitor it closely and that we monitor it accurately. Weighing diapers for these guys is really important to get an accurate intake and output measurement. It's not enough just to record one wet diaper. We want to know what that diaper weighed. Um, a comparison of intake and output over an 8 to a 24 hour period provides really important information in relationship to their kidney function and their fluid balance. So staying on top of that and being able to look at a running tally of um, uh, like a running graph of what that looks like over time can be very helpful to providers. Assessment of those patterns um, are essential again for fluid management um, and are, are used by providers to uh, dictate how they uh, determine um, how what next steps they want to take in terms of care. Nurses will monitor blood serum levels in relationship to pH so that we can evaluate for electrolyte imbalances. And we want to also make sure we're accurate in our um, monitoring and our calculations in relationship to hourly intake whenever we administer IV fluids. Um, because if we are off in the least little bit for a pretermer, we can cause um, overload. We got to make sure we're giving correct solutions correct volumes and correct concentrations of formula as well. It's a very delicate balance for these guys. Feeding methods are determined again by their abilities and their health status. Um, so nipple and gavage feedings um, might initially be supplemented with IV therapy. And um, once they seem to be a little more stable, then we might can discontinue the IV therapy and move to just nipple or gavage feedings. Um, minimal enteral nutrition via gavage for uh, early small volume enteral feedings. Um, are appropriate and it's beneficial for very low birth weight newborns. Um, GI priming with very small volume feedings is not intended really to contribute to the total nutritional intake of these guys, but we do that in order to enhance gut metabolism, so to get their gut to start working. Trophic feedings may help encourage earlier advancement to full feedings and it decreases the development of necrotizing enterocolitis and complications of parenteral nutrition. Um, formula and, or breast milk can be incorporated into feedings really slowly um, to avoid overtaxing the digestive capacity as well. Um, really what I want you to know is that their gut is very sensitive and uh, that they are at a greater risk for aspiration. Um, you need to know what gavage feeding is and why we are very careful in terms of um, feeding babies in relationship to fatigue and oxygenation. Um, from, from an oxygen, oxygenation standpoint. Um, I am not really expecting you guys to know all these differences in terms of trophic feedings and um, all of that. We need to be assessing for signs of feeding intolerance, so increasing gastric residuals um, can clue you in to the fact that they're not digesting things appropriately um, or that they are not utilizing what they're being fed and that they're, that means they're not tolerating their feedings. So making sure that you're accurate in checking residuals is important. 
um, abdominal distension, um, guaiac positive stools, vomiting, diarrhea, and water loss stools are all signs of feeding intolerance. Before every feeding, the nurse should do the following things. We need to measure abdominal girth. We need to auscultate for bowel sounds and check the residual when we're talking about gavage feedings. Um, it's also done when the nipple um, fed newborn has abdominal distension. And presence of abdominal distension can, um, um, a presence of residual can indicate that there is an, a tolerance of the type of feeding that you're giving or the amount that's being given. Preterm newborns who are ill or who fatigue very easily are usually fed by gavage because it doesn't take that suck and swallow and extra energy to get that to their gut. Um, they, these guys are essentially very passive and we want them to continue to conserve energy and calories, which is why we choose this method. But as the baby matures, we can replace gavage feedings with nipple feedings. And we might not do it all at one time, but we might supplement one gavage feeding with a nipple feeding um, and assess how they tolerate that and then advance feedings from there. Um, we do this to assist them in strengthening their suck reflex and to meet their oral and their emotional needs. Um, there are some certain signs that we look for to show us that a newborn is ready or premature newborn is ready for oral feedings. If they have a strong gag reflex, um, if they are starting to utilize non-nutritive sucking behaviors, um, and rooting behaviors, we know that they are showing us that they um, may be ready for um, some oral feedings. The nurse can establish, uh, can establish a gradual nipple feeding program and advance feedings from gavage to nipple as appropriately. Um, but again, important to really be weighing the baby um, and it's okay if a small little weight loss occurs when the nipple feeding is started because again that's taking more work and burning a little calories to be able to do that as compared to gavage feedings. You want to always involve the parents in feeding the preterm newborn um, because that will um, give them a sense that they are taking care of things and I uh, can help them transition um, and also show the nurse that they know what they're doing. We want to also prevent infection for these guys. The nurse is responsible for minimizing the newborn's exposure to pathogens and that means even with visitors who are coming in to the NICU. Um, the nurse is responsible for ensuring everybody has washed up appropriately and in some cases gowned up. Um, premature newborn is really susceptible to infection as we know because they have a very thin and permeable skin layer and their immune system is very immature. So strict hand hygiene is um, of utter importance separating equipment for every neonate, not sharing O2 sat monitors, not sharing um, um, blood pressure cuffs or anything like that. We want to make sure we have separate equipment for every single patient. Um, and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention um, have standards, uh, precautions for isolating a baby. And um, we want to make sure that we are following those. A two to three minute scrub with antibacterial uh, solution by staff members is appropriate. Limiting visitors, strict aseptic technique when changing IV tubing and solutions. There's no room for error, you guys, with preterm newborns. Um, and because their skin is so thin and pliable, 
making sure that we are utilizing position changes so that we can prevent breakdown is also important. Um, the nurse is going to be the first person to identify any subtle clinical signs of infection. And so it's important for you to know what you're looking for and to report it. Promoting attachment is extremely important in um, the preterm baby. These guys uh, um, are often in an incubator. They can't be held. Um, it is because they're, uh, we're trying to maintain temperature and decrease their basal metabolic rate, um, increase oxygenation, decrease hypoxic events. And so for the newborn who has stayed away to promote bonding in the NICU is to allow the parents opportunities for touching and holding if possible and kangaroo care specifically, which is where they sort of wear the baby on their chest. Um, but because the preterm baby is separated from its parents such a prolonged period of time, it interrupts this bonding process. So we've got to take measures to be able to promote positive parental feelings towards the baby um, as in as many ways as we can. So photographs for them to take home, especially, or to the mother if she's too ill to come to the nursery. Um, the baby's first name on the incubator instead of baby girl ward or baby girl hill, you'd want to put the first name. Um, giving parents a weekly card with the baby's footprint and the weight and the length so that they have some type of keepsake. Making sure they have the phone number to the nursery, the NICU, the names of the staff members so that they can have access to information about the baby all the time. Um, and encouraging visits from the siblings and the grandparents as long as we're not increasing the risk for infection. So we wouldn't want any sickly siblings to be coming and visiting in the NICU. We want to um, involve the parents in care as early as we possibly can and make sure that um, decisions that are being made provide realistic expectations for the parents. We don't want them to expect to be able to take this home, this baby home as a normal kid if that is not going to be the case. Um, by observing the baby's patterns of behaviors and responses, the nurse can teach the optimal time for parents to interact with the baby. So again, here we're back to periods of reactivity, what they are and um, how can we respond and plan care around those time frames. Parents and nurses can, um, can increase um, and attachment and bonding behaviors if we schedule those times when the baby's alert and is best able to respond to the parents. Um, parents are going to need education regarding caregiving skills, especially if there are going to be some high level skills that have to be performed once this baby gets home. Um, Encouraging the parents to visit frequently and have some type of daily participation is important in promoting attachment as well. Um, and some parents are not going to progress very easily from this touching to the cuddling phase. Um, and that's okay. Nurses need to know and need to encourage parents that their feelings are normal and that progression um, in from this touching to cuddling phase can be really slow. And sometimes it's not because parents don't want to, but it's because they are so afraid to touch something so small or because they're afraid they're going to mess up the lines or the tubes or the machines. So trying to put them at ease and decreasing their anxiety related to care and attachment is a huge piece um, of being a NICU nurse and promoting that attachment. We want to make sure also that we are promoting developmentally supportive care for these individuals. 
um, prolonged separation in the NICU environment um, necessitate individualized baby sensory stimulation programs. So many hospitals have different types of programs and uh, know of places in the community that provide services and developmentally supportive care or DSC interventions are things like music therapy and light touch, massage and vestibular stimulation. Um, all of those things can be provided and in bigger areas are provided in the hospital. Um, some preterm infants are not developmentally able to deal with more than one sensory input at a time. So that's why when you walk into the NICU, typically things are, uh, the lights are low, things are quiet, um, because these babies can't handle, especially at a very young gestational age, a lot of sensory things going on at one time. Um, there are some tools available for assessing newborn's behavior following developmentally supportive care interventions. And um, we can evaluate their autonomic and their visceral systems, their state and attention interaction system, the baby's reactions to stimulations are observed, and then interventions are based on reducing detrimental stimuli. So basically, we're looking at the baby, determining what it can handle, and then, and then planning care based upon that from a sensory standpoint. Providing supportive, family-centered care improves the outcome of critically ill newborns. Um, and that is just what it is. Um, many NICUs now are being designed with this single room concept. So uh, much like the labor and delivery rooms, these places look a little more like home. Um, when, you, you, when you used to think of a NICU, you would think of one area where all, you think of something sort of like a critical care unit um, without the rooms. So there was one huge room and there were isolates all in this room and that's, that was the NICU. But now they're being developed with the single room concept and part of that is to provide a family centered environment. We've replaced alarms with lights in order to lower the noise levels um, so that we don't, um, we're not providing any kind of detrimental stimuli to the, to the preterms. We silence alarms quickly, keep conversations away from the newborn bedside so that we're not disturbing them with auditory stimuli. We use a dimmer switch to shield their eyes from lights, place blankets over the top portion of the incubator to keep things dark. Um, and nursing care needs to be planned and grouped together in order to decrease the number of times that we are disturbing the preterm baby. Um, because again, a big part of what we do is decreasing the stimuli um, number one, because many of them can't handle it, and number two, because the more you interrupt somebody and increase the stimuli, the more their basal metabolic rate goes up. We want these guys conserving their energy. So what types of other developmentally supportive interventions can we talk about? Um, we can use containment measures when turning or moving the neonate, um, touching the preterm baby gently and avoiding sudden changes in their postural um, positions can um, be a supportive intervention. Uh, promoting and consoling, um, doing soothing activities, blanket rolls or appropriate devices next to their sides and their feet, swaddling to keep their extremities in a flexed position, um, but also making sure their hands can reach their face. Um, all of those things promote self-consoling, self-quieting behaviors. 
stimulating kinesthetic advantages of the intrauterine environment. So sheepskin, approved waterbeds, those are some different things that you might see utilized in the NICU in order to make them feel like they're back inside mom. Um, we always want to be promoting opportunities for non-nutritive sucking because, again, that's a self-quieting behavior. But it's also, for these guys, allowing them to develop a reflex that they need to eat. Provide objects for them to hold on to and grasp. Again, that's another reflex that we want them to develop. Teaching parents how to read their behavioral cues and help them move at the baby's pace when providing stimulation. So instead of a mom, uh, you know, utilizing her own pace when caring and providing stimulation, such as patting the back or swaying the baby back and forth, um, we might need to educate her that some of the behavioral cues are not supportive of what she's doing, but let's try something a little different that's a little less stimulating. Um, I mentioned kangaroo hair, which is basically skin-to-skin -skin contact, and that's becoming much more prevalent in NICUs, um, and that just has to do with holding the newborn skin-to-skin -skin against the parent. Usually the newborn's naked except for the diaper, and we place them on the parent's bare chest. We cover both of them with a blanket, and it's been shown to improve oxygenation in the preemie, to enhance temperature regulation, to, um, it's been shown to um, decline the episodes of apnea and bradycardia in these kids. It'll increase periods of quiet sleep, which is great for these guys because quiet sleep will allow them to conserve energy. Um, stabilization of vital signs has been shown um, and of course we're promoting and enhancing attachment and bonding while we do this. It helps to increase their growth parameters and has been shown to even um, give early discharge or allow for early discharge. So Really quickly, some other types of developmentally supportive care. We have things like music therapy, and this has not really been studied well in the preterm neonate, but it is non-invasive, and it can provide some auditory stimuli, and it's been shown to be um, advantageous in term babies. Um, so you know, it may or may not be beneficial to use in your preterm one. But if we used it, we'd want soft and calming um, music and, you know, not like metalhead music because that wouldn't be good. It um, can improve oxygenation and increase weight gain if it is a sensory stimuli that the baby can tolerate and likes. Um, it can enhance parental bonding and increase non-nutritive sucking periods. Again, um, all if it's a, a stimuli that the baby can tolerate. Um, and it would also be important to make sure that you consider the other types of noise that's going on in the environment before you add something extra. Another type of supportive care technique are massage and stroking, gentle touch um, without stroking, and then hands-on containment. Um, this helps to demonstrate compassion while increasing the parent's empathy and understanding of the baby. It helps parents to learn to interpret the baby's behavioral cues, and it helps the newborn to learn body parts and boundaries. When we prepare these guides for home care, parents are oftentimes very um, anxious when the preterm newborn is transferred out of the NICU or discharged home. In the NICU, they receive such support, and there's always somebody there by their side. Um, so whenever they're released home, it is an extremely anxious time for these people and they need to receive the same postpartum teaching as any parent taking a new baby home, um, but 
that teaching has to go even above and beyond most times. So we want to encourage them to care for the baby before discharge because we want to be able to observe that in the NICU and be able to offer opportunities for improvement when we assess their caring behaviors. Discharge instructions for preemies include feeding techniques, formula preparation, if they have to have extra vitamins, how to give those. Um, for breast milk feeders, pumping before discharge to keep the milk flowing if she wants to breastfeed. We want to give them information on bathing and diapering, hygiene, how a normal elimination patterns might look once they get home. Um, what would be a normal growth and developmental pattern and process for this particular kid and information related to any complications that might occur, signs and symptoms to look for, um, and any type of m medical follow-up visits that need to be scheduled and numbers to those places. Oftentimes these guys have referrals particularly if they have things like congenital anomalies, they are having feeding intolerance or other feeding problems, um, they have been infected or had some type of complication related to an infection, or they're still struggling from a respiratory standpoint. Um, also, we want to be cognizant to make referrals if the parents seem to be unable to cope with the situation um, and they're not moving through this maturational crisis um, in an appropriate manner. So we might want to offer support groups uh, or early education intervention centers. Um, Preterm and low birth weight infants are at a greater risk for morbidity from vaccine preventable diseases. So making sure that parents have their vaccinations, making sure that uh, caregivers have vaccinations, and making sure that parents are aware that having the baby vaccinated at the appropriate timing is um, very important. From an evaluation standpoint, we expect that our preterm newborn is going to be free of respiratory distress and can effectively adapt to extra uterine life from a respiratory functional capacity standpoint. That it gains weight and shows no signs of fatigue or aspiration during feedings that it demonstrates a serial head circumference growth rate of one centimeter per week. Um, we want to make sure that for the parents, they can verbalize feelings of anger or guilt associated with why this occurred, that they can show attachment behaviors and bonding, and that they feel confident and can demonstrate care activities related to the newborn. Um, and then um, lastly, additional care evaluation determines whether further care is needed down the road. So that concludes uh, individual module six, PowerPoint two, uh, related to prematurity. And thanks for listening.